you also did a paper for Fourth Wave Now with Professor Bailey on the five types of gender dysphoria. The, the five included psychotics who get right. the delusion that their sex is changing, not necessarily according to their will, but that their sex is changing as something imposed on them or that's happening irrespective of their desires. Right. I don't really call it a type of gender dysphoria, but it's something you, somebody might see in their office sometime. The one that I think, and this is what I've been spending the most time with, and I'd like to get your thoughts on it, is what I think is the biggest epidemic right now as far as within this area, which is the rapid onset gender dysphoria, mostly in girls. What are you seeing from your perspective? Well, from my perspective, it's what I read about it because I have never seen child patients for any type of, of psychiatric problem, including gender identity disorders. Okay. I always saw adult patients when I, I was see. seeing patients. And I guess I got kind of brought into it partly in the wake of Ken Zucker's being fired, and I kind of became a de facto spokesperson to some extent for him. And then I got brought into these matters, but I don't have hands-on clinical experience with the rapid onset cases. However, there seems to be a fair amount of unanimity among people who are seeing them on certain factors, such as the fact that this is overwhelmingly females, biological girls, and not biological boys, that the age of onset is any time after puberty to, to late adolescence, that there previously had been no early history of cross-gender behavior going back to ages five or six, and that the uh, beginning of the claims of being transgender very often are in a context that suggests social contagion, such as uh, the individual being online on Tumblr or Reddit or someplace where they get exposed to a lot of transgender material, or they belong to a peer group in which a cluster of, of kids, sometimes three or four in one peer group, one after another, declare themselves as trans. So people who have firsthand experience are pretty consistent in their reports of what this looks like. And I heard one person saying, when the parents say, look, there's literally no trace of any type of cross-sex behavior or inclinations from childhood, they say, well, that's just because they didn't feel like they could open up to you. And I guess with homosexuality, we have seen some people who truly uh, were able to suppress, you know, maybe not in a healthy way, but, you know, didn't let other people know. So I guess that argument could be made that truly these kids, it's just that, you know, now that it's being more accepted, now they're able to come into who they are and thank goodness so the historical rates of transgender people have been exceedingly low because they didn't have that opportunity to come out versus what you're saying it really does sound like social contagion what, what's the argument is against that for someone who says that no they just they never felt safe in coming out in any capacity okay and i've got I one answer the best argument at that is by looking at the early onset cases Okay, so these children from a very young age, maybe kindergarten or whatever, are gravitating towards opposite sex peers. They like to play with toys stereotypically associated with the opposite sex. They do a whole bunch of different things to signal what sex they're identifying as long, long before they would be old enough to be thinking of hiding their gender identity from their parents. Right. I just don't believe it. Moreover, these kids are quite often detected, in a sense, by their peers, and they're called sissy or called tomboy. You know, so they're giving off such strong vibes, such powerful signals that there's something unusual about their gender identity or gender role, that they give off these signals when they don't even want to give off these signals, when they might want to pass unremarked. So I think they radiate this in such a way that for somebody to say, oh, yeah, I had all of that, too. But, you know, starting age four on, I, I made an attempt to conceal it from my parents. I, I have a hard time swallowing that. And I, I really hope a lot of people watch that because it's difficult to battle against these false narratives being portrayed and being really overly readily accepted just because so many people are invested in this psychologically or for other reasons. So I'm glad that you conveyed it in such a succinct, clear way. And I hope people can understand that. Of course, there will be people who refuse to accept that. There will always be those special cases. And it's, it's funny because now they're no longer special cases because they're the vast majority of cases. Because as you said, by definition, all these children with rapid onset gender dysphoria gave no indication previously. 
So I'm glad that you put it that way. Thank you. And what about in what you're hearing, what percentage have autism? You know, in that regard, I could only speak from what I've read. And, you know, I really don't have a strong opinion about that because we're talking autism spectrum disorder. We're not talking sure. about kids who are clearly diagnosed as flat out autistic. Sure. And, sure. and I don't have a strong feeling about what percentage of them are milder, you know, or high functioning, what used to be called Asperger's. Right. Okay. Because most of the cases with the parents who have contacted me, their children have been diagnosed with high functioning autism or Asperger's. A few of them, however, it's kind of going the opposite way. They're saying my child was never diagnosed with that. But now that they are coming out with ROGD, now I want them to be assessed to see whether they may have actually had autism. And that's why they're doing it. It's kind of it's weird how it's morphing in that way. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't fancy the idea of parents fishing for a particular diagnosis that's less objectionable than transsexualism, but I certainly like the idea that parents are looking for clinical exploration beyond having their kid rubber stamped as trans and put on the conveyor belt to transition. And, and people have to understand that. This is why I feel so compelled to help. I mean, as a parent myself, uh, none of my children have displayed any opposite sex behavior or inclinations, but I just, I hear the pain in their voices and it's not the pain of my child is trans or confused or struggling. It's the pain of when I seek answers, I get labeled a bigot. I'm told I'm a terrible person. I'm a monster. I don't understand my children. I'm going to cause them to kill themselves because I didn't affirm their identity right away. And that's my concern, or that's one of my many concerns in all of this. It's amazing how hateful people can be toward parents who are just trying to do what's right for their children. Yeah, I agree with you. That's... Um has been astounding and I'm happy that some parents are now banding together and trying to provide some kind of resource for parents who are getting gaslighted really because they're, they're, they just want to get maybe a second clinical opinion and find out is this a done deal that my kid is trans and that's where this is headed and uh, the reward they get for trying to get a variety of clinical opinion is to be told that if you don't toe the line, your kid's going to kill themselves and it's going to all be your fault. Right. And it's terrifying. I mean, like, how dare people do that? And I understand for some people, especially trans kids who say that or trans adults, I understand they're speaking from their own trauma, maybe from their own experience. But to put that on parents is just wrong and it's not borne out necessarily. I mean, we know that trans kids, people have a higher rate of suicide, but to say that if you don't affirm it right away, you know, it's a death sentence. It's just hysteria and it's wrong. Uh, well, it's a form of blackmail and it worked for a while, but I think that there is starting to be pushback now. And I, there is now questioning of the statistics. Where did these high rates of suicide come from? And although I can't rhyme off to you what study it came from and why it's spurious, uh, other people have put this online. So I think that the transition your kid or they'll kill themselves has started losing impact and I think it's going to lose impact more. I'm not so sure about that because I don't know if it was a recent study where they're showing here children who were affirmed. It's a longitudinal study and they were affirmed as a young child by the age of like I think they followed it maybe around uh, puberty, maybe up to 17, that they have depression, anxiety and self-harm or suicidal rates equal to or less than non-trans kids so that came out recently or at least it's been put out on twitter recently so people are going to point to that and say see that's evidence that if you don't do it they're going to kill themselves that's how it's going to try to stem the tide of reason by trying to say this is the evidence for what we're saying so it's an uphill battle to bring prudence and reality to this very challenging discussion. It's I'll analogous to having been back in the days when there was a fad for ritual satanic ch uh, child abuse and recovered memories of multiple personalities. I'm sure there were reasonable voices throughout the middle of those fads, but they probably didn't get heard until the fad was starting to pass. Sadly, though, in this case, uh, this fad is going to take with it many kids who are going to, as adults, I've been hearing this more and more now, they're just waiting for the lawsuits to happen when, you know, they say, I can't have children, or I mutilated my body, I was sent in the wrong path. So that's sadly what I'm hearing people prognosticating on, because there's a real life impact. I mean, they're amputating their bodies, sometimes you know, not necessarily accurately. So I know that Dr. James Cantor, who I've also had on this podcast, he just published something a few days ago where he's reiterating this idea of desistance rates and saying that there's all this controversy where people are denigrating or even just outright dismissing all studies that show that 
the majority of children who identify as the opposite sex will eventually desist and they won't feel that way anymore. And he said that no matter how you slice it, at the very least, it's still over 50%. Yeah. So I was thinking about that. I mean, if my child had a certain condition and there's an over 50% chance that if we go ahead with listening to these gender affirmative therapists, that if they mutilate their body, that there's an over 50% chance that they're making the wrong decision, that's pretty scary. Well, the answer to the gender affirmative types is to say, well, if they reverted, they were never truly trans in the first place. Right. So that's that's how they try to dismiss the evidence. If they reverted, they were never truly trans. Right. It's called the no true Scotsman argument. It's of that form. And of course, it's furious, but that's their comeback. And some of them will just flatly say that they can tell. They know. They can clinically differentiate on the basis of interviewing patients which ones are truly transsexual and which ones are just, what should we call them, faux transsexual. Right. And so I think must, this must make them great clinical geniuses because none of the real life clinicians I know get diagnosis right 100% of the cases or predict prognosis in 100% of the cases correctly. So I guess the field of affirmative therapy is lucky to have these Olympian figures who can look right into the soul of a kid and differentiate those who are the real article from those who are at risk of desisting and uh, having made a horrible mistake in their lives. Right. And I'm smiling, not because you're being facetious about that, but because it seems so obvious when you say it, yet the people who insist, no, no, as you say, I can tell, they don't see that it's so ridiculous to make such claims. And again, the fact is they are playing with real lives. And that's the whole purpose of this video series I've been making. Again, I've got no skin in the game other than I get really concerned when I hear about people who are being led down the wrong path. You know, again, I hate to keep reiterating that, but I hope people understand that because otherwise they're just thinking I'm just transphobic, you're transphobic, we're just trying to ruin people's lives the other way by not letting them be who they are. Now, speaking of which, I'm curious, I want to ask you because you mentioned you've written eight articles where you say that medical transition can be right for some people. If you were to, to set the guideline, at what age do you think we should allow such, let's say, the actual surgery itself? I'm going to start with that. Well, these ages are always arbitrary, but I say if we're talking about irreversible surgery on the genitals, I'd put it at 21. Are you for or against you know, puberty blockers? Sorry, it's My name is actually like last author on a paper with Ken Zucker in which he published about use of puberty blocking hormones with uh, patients he was seeing. I think he put his name on because I helped him with some statistics or something because it wasn't anything I was into. But I'm a little iffy about it. All in all, I would rather not see it happening. You know, I think the original rationale was spurious. The rationale was to give the kid time to think before right. uh, they made a decision about whether which gender they wanted to live as. They talked as if this was some kind of reversible benign condition that would just postpone a decision, but it's not that because life goes on. And what the data look like is that uh, giving puberty blocking hormones locks kids into a transsexual trajectory. Right. And that's the point I wanted to make. Exactly. So if there's a whole bunch of faux trans kids being included in all these data, then we know there's a bunch of faux trans kids being put on this as you say, trajectory to the next step, which is cross-sex hormones, and then the next step, which could be surgery. So that's, to me, the, the biggest concern. And I keep saying this in all these videos, the trans activists are trying to make it seem like such a benign process. Ridiculous. Because they say the flip side is, well, why would you allow a kid to go through such trauma of having their body develop in this way that's not right for them? Well, prior to the use of puberty-blocking hormones, the routine life cycle of a transsexual was they went through this trauma, quote unquote, and um, many of them survived it and survived it just fine. They, they were not committing themselves en masse and they got whatever they had to have afterwards in terms of surgical procedure and that was that. I mean, I'm going to assume that the trans activists will say, well, yes, that's true, but this is why there's such a high rate of suicide even among people who transition or high rates of depression or whatever because they went through the puberty and th that's why it still persists. All psychiatric populations have higher rates of suicide than non-psychiatric populations. Where are the data that transsexuals have a, 
post-op or pre-op or wherever have higher rates of suicide than other psychiatric populations. They have the same rate of suicide as other psychiatric populations. But that's the problem because you're putting them into the category of psychiatric populations. And I have no problem with that. Right. Well, there's a lot of people who do. And again, the, the people who have a problem with that, they're not pointing to science. They're pointing to ideology, which says that we should not treat that as a mental health condition. What do you do? Except with when you want to make an insurance claim. For those few minutes, you can you can you can hold your nose and and sign on for it. But you know, and when I you know when I say that transsexualism is a psychiatric disorder this doesn't mean that i'm saying transsexuals are barking mad that they are at all times uh, out of control or, or you know I've, I've known personally transsexuals who were extremely intelligent creative functioned perfectly in their work lives had normal kinds of social interactions it's just there is this one fairly encapsulated area in which they have a fixed belief that is out of touch with reality, which we don't know how to fix, and which is it's easier to just go with than try and subject them to a life that gives them constant distress. So for me, there is no contradiction between saying this is a psychiatric disorder and saying I'm in favor of letting people live out their life as they want to live it and in helping them out with surgery or hormones and calling them Miss or Mr. or whatever they want because what skin is it off your back? And again, this is why I'm having this series so people can actually hear your own words rather than fall into this delusion of it's just a monster. Right. We shouldn't listen to these monsters who just happen to be professionals, who just happen to have published papers, have done the research, have worked with people. What do they know? I'm trying to counter that. So that's my segue to the next question, which is there's so much controversy over this. And I find this is where I have to just disengage from people where they say the proof that the other big monster in Toronto, Dr. Ken Zucker, the proof that he's such a monster and the proof of why we should have not allowed that documentary from the BBC to be played on the CBC recently. The proof is that he was fired from CAMH not for any political reasons, but purely because he was doing conversion therapy, he was harming children, he had this agenda, and that's proof. And that he, you, and Dr. Bailey, and Dr. Cantor, and Dr. Dreger are the only ones in the world who are sticking with this antiquated, harmful system, this prudent approach, instead of this gender-affirmative approach, which everybody else agrees with. That's the narrative that's being portrayed. But they point to his firing as the evidence for all of this. I, I don't know how much you're allowed to talk about this. I wanted to have Dr. Zucker on, but he he's has. in litigation. Everybody knows he's in litigation. Right. So I'm not sure what you can say, but can you give some insights into what happened just to maybe kind of help to refute that, that narrative that's being portrayed? Well, here's the sequence of events. There is a taxpayer funded an Ontario government funded consultancy group called Rainbow Health Ontario which is housed over at the Sherborne Health Center. And they're a group that's supposed to, I don't know, somehow assure access for LGBT people in the healthcare community or whatever. It's one of these vague mandates. But, you know, they get paid salaries for doing it. So a few years ago, a delegation from this Rainbow Health Ontario went to CAMH with their list of complaints about Ken Zucker. Uh, the CAMH then undertook uh, a kind of show trial by hiring what were supposed to be objective external consultants to evaluate Dr. Zucker's treatment. So they did their thing and they produced some report, which actually didn't call for the clinic being closed or Dr. Zucker being fired, but that's what the CAMH decided to do anyway. In my opinion, this was predetermined and that they were just waiting for the external consultants report as their justification for taking a course of action they had already decided to take. So that was how it went down. Uh, I think they were planning on doing the equivalent of beheading somebody and putting their head on a pole uh, by putting the uh, external assessors report on the CAMH corporate website. Here it hit a little bump because the external assessor's report contained material that was demonstrably false and libelous, all of which was uncovered by an investigative reporter operating out of the U.S. So once Jesse that's Jesse Single, yes, 
Yeah, and he was able to find all of this out without setting foot in Toronto, and yet, strangely, people working and living in Toronto couldn't even be bothered to look at this report before putting it on the uh, CAMH website. So they were forced to take it down. But they were certainly not going to undo uh, the, the firing of Ken Zucker, which was what they had intended from the beginning. Right. And so I think it was, from beginning to end, a political act. There was no systematic attempt to poll the patients of that clinic to see how many people who had been treated there were satisfied or dissatisfied with their treatment. Nothing like that ever happened. So when people try to say that, the part that you mentioned, for example, that very libelous comment where he was alleged to have said to a young man, was it your hairy little vermin? Something like that. Yeah. So then people, when I point that out as one point, and then I say about the whole uh, investigation that Jesse had done, and he's written several articles on it, and I link it to them. So then they go, two things. One, they say, well, look at where Jesse is now. He's being discredited. They're saying that he was is demoted because he's been proved to have an agenda. He doesn't check his facts, etc. Number one, yeah. And then number two, they say, okay, well, notwithstanding the hairy little vermin, they said everything else was verified, that Dr. Zucker has been doing this it's no longer considered to be the right type of treatment. It's being discredited. It's, you know, that he's the only one who was doing that anymore. How do we counter this idea that despite the hairy little vermin false comment, they say everything else was shown to be accurate, that Dr. Zucker was doing antiquated, bad treatments? Nothing else was, was shown to be true. You know, it's, it's hard to know where to even start when people will just assert one thing after another after another with zero basis and with such authority. The trans activists and their allies throw around words like discredited and debunked when it merely means there now is a fad in a different direction. And if you're not with that fad, you've been dis discredited by the mere fact that you're not part of that fad. That's what discredited means, is that Ken Zucker did not join the bandwagon of cheerleading for transition for prepubertal children. There is no discrediting. It's, it's a meaningless thing. It's hard to address because it's so devoid of meaning except its emotional meaning within certain activist circles. I'm hoping that aside from the tiny percentage of people who will say that and refuse to listen to reason, the ones who are more moderate and just don't know any better and are hearing all this trans activist BS will hear you say this and maybe they'll do their own investigation, their own reading and might be encouraged to realize that they've been fed a narrative that has very little basis in truth. 